Hello and welcome to this edition of the Beacon Hill Report. Joining us today in studio is State Representative Paul Schmidt of Westport, who also represents part of New Bedford from the 8th Bristol District. Thanks for joining us again. Always a pleasure to be on with you, Jim. Busy time of year as we uh, kick off the new year and as we sit here in the studio, one of the things obviously that comes up the, uh, next week, big uh, events, if you will. The governor is has his State of the State address. He also releases his budget, which is sort of a guideline for now the legislature to do their budgets. Um, I guess just give us an overview as to time. W what are you looking for from both those, uh, the release of the budget and the state of the state? Sure. Well, naturally, we're all looking forward to uh, hearing uh, what the budget, what the governor's specifics are uh, regarding uh, how he wants to deal with uh, transportation and with housing. And uh, as we were just talking before the camera started to roll, uh, we are better than halfway through uh, the session now. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislature must cease uh, its activities uh, at the end of July, and that's coming up in uh, just about six months. So a lot of the important issues are going to be <coughs> dealt with between now and then. And I think y you make a list of the important stuff, uh, I think you start with transportation, uh, and I'm sure that uh, second in the governor's priorities will be housing. Uh, so those two issues, transportation and housing, uh, we'll certainly be dealing with. As you look at those two issues, both of those issues affect down here differently than obviously within that 128 belt that we talk about so often, um, but they are still huge issues down here. Um, well, let me backtrack first. The governor comes out, he, he does a state of the state, and obviously this is a heavily democratic area of state. Um, but there are some, the legislature and the governor do have, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, agreements or uh, issues that they want to get tackled, uh, that they want tackled. Uh, do you find that there's common ground, I guess, between that executive branch and the legislative branch on just the issues that need to be addressed? Well, I do, and I actually uh, think that uh, the legislature uh, has probably a better relationship uh, with Governor Baker than it's had uh, with uh, some previous governors. Uh, he seems to be the kind of person who wants to work with us, and, and the legislature always responds well uh, to governors who want to work with us. Uh, so it's not as though, I mean, again, the, the end results are never going to be what everybody wants, but I, I think, uh, you know, f from the outside you're looking in, at least if you can get the issues that really need to be addressed, that's half the battle right there. Yeah, and as you said, uh, neither side is going to get everything uh, that it wants, but that's the uh, basis of democracy, isn't it? That uh, you're very happy to take half of what you want and uh, move on to the next. And uh, on the issue of transportation, of course the major issue on transportation in Massachusetts is the greater Boston area and uh, the difficulties in getting into uh, Boston as all of us who go up to Beacon Hill uh, three, four, five days a week, understand. We talked about that last time, and I think I've, uh, in your colleagues when they've come in too, because at that time earlier last year, uh, one of the issues that always seemed to come up uh, that was being talked about uh, and uh, written about in the paper was a gas tax, which doesn't now, which has seemed to have uh, lost some steam, if you will. And I know <laughs> talking to all, all the reps, they're not very happy about that because it affects those outside the 128 belt more. Um, and it pays for the transportation of Boston. Um, but now the idea of you're looking at tolls being floated as a, as a, as a sort of a revenue source. Um, and that's relatively new, I guess. What, what are yeah. you hearing up there? Is that something that's more palatable than Well, I, I think we're be definitely beginning to talk about t tolls. And folks are saying 
you know, if you're commuting from western Massachusetts, you pay to get into Boston on the Mass Pike. Correct. But if you're coming from the north or from the south, you're not paying. So what's the equity there? And that gets people thinking about putting up those uh, 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 the Easy pass uh, things. Easy pass yeah. things across, uh, who knows, across the uh, uh, Tobin Bridge, putting tolls back on the Tobin Bridge coming in or tolls on the Southeast Expressway. Uh, Is it a question of fairness, though? I mean, when you look at... Well, that's the way they express it. Right. Yeah, that, that, it, and it, so that gives them an argument uh, for, for tolling. Right. That, I have a feeling that tolls may be a part of the package. Of course, you know, it's a little complicated because the governor is working on this northeastern states uh, uh, pack to uh, put a uh, tax on transportation fuel. Mm -hmm. and, and although we hear now that uh, some of the other governors That's what the climate, for the climate change. For climate change. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but some of the other governors are maybe not so sure about going into it. I think uh, New Hampshire, Sununu, has said he's not going in it. Maine is maybe. So we don't, and, and that would put a, an extra tax on gasoline, diesel fuels, fuels of all type. So will, will that happen? And how does that affect uh, the notion of a gas tax in Massachusetts? These are the kinds of things uh, that we're going to be dealing with in the next couple of months. Thankfully, Chairman Strauss uh, from Mattapoisett is in the thick of things, and uh, we're going to be hearing a lot and depending on his uh, guidance on this. I would assume that the, either one is just going to be on the, uh, on the unpopular side from folks that aren't in that 128 belt. Sure. We're all going to say, we're all going to say, What's in it for us? Exactly. We're, Especially we're, if all the repairs. We're, pay, we're paying that. We're going to be paying that. What do we get? Right. And uh, we're actually uh, the Gateway City Caucus, which is the New Bedfords and Fall Rivers of this world, are going to be meeting with Ways and Means Chair Michael Witz and Chairman Strauss uh, this coming week uh, to discuss uh, how transportation affects New Bedford. And one of the points we're going to be making is that we need more money for our regional transportation. And I would assume if, 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 if the transportation uh, improves, not just here, but in, in the other lying spots, the Cape, the Western Massachusetts, is the North Shore, those benefit, obviously, the entire state as well. Um, and I guess, kind of what we're going back to, I'm circling around, but. If all the money for transportation is just going in that 128 belt, you're right. I mean, what, what's the point then for everybody else? Yeah. Well, you know, on that point that you're making, as we were advocating and arguing for South Coast Rail, mm -hmm. we often made the point, this isn't just for the South Coast. This is for Boston because Boston needs moderately priced housing. Right, for, the, which to, is what for, for the growing workforce. Right, and we have that down here. We just don't have a convenient, easy, reliable, stress-free way of getting to Boston. South Coast Rail certainly will help. And I would assume, if I'm not mistaken, though, probably for you, typical day, it's at least an hour and a half, two-hour ride to Boston every day. We generally figure that if we have an appointment, say at nine o'clock in, in the state house, we'd better be leaving here at quarter of seven. Now, it may not take that full two and a quarter hours door to door, but it could. Right. So, to be safe, and that's great, and, and, and you can't get anything done. Right. And I would imagine, I mean, obviously Western Massachusetts is even worse. They're just as, they're just as bad and, and, and worse. So, but in addition to uh, I'll, uh, get, getting better transportation to and from Boston. We need better transportation within the South Coast. We need more. We need better schedules, later schedules, weekend schedules for getting back and forth between New Bedford and Fall River. For getting over to Providence. My heavens, Providence is thriving right now, and it's thirty minutes away. Thirty-five it's 30 minutes, minutes away. Thirty minutes away. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we don't have. 
uh, reliable uh, commuter scheduled uh, bus transportation to Providence. So when you, not you, but when the delegation or the, the region representatives talk about transportation, I mean, that's a great point too. We're not just talking about going to Boston, you are talking about just improving just down here. Yeah. Um, is, is that something that resonates with, I mean, because everybody else is vying for it too. I assume the Cape's got their own issues down there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's gotta be difficult I mean, you got to prioritize. What are the big things that we need in uh, southeastern Massachusetts, greater New Bedford, to, uh, for transportation-wise? Sure. So I think that you know, it's just up to us to make the point that uh, in a transportation package, there has to be increased funding for the so-called RTAs, the regional transportation authorities. Mm -hmm. End of point. Uh, as you talk about the, uh, so you talked about that and you touched upon housing briefly uh, a moment ago too is the, one of the things the governor is going to talk about and you talked about uh, housing in Boston as well. I know most of the housing issues are in Boston because the, the, the pricing is, is out it's of cool, sight. Cool, cool, cool. It's out of sight. Uh, having uh, children that, uh, knowing children that are living up there, you've got five people in a house and they're still paying $2,000 a month of, uh, for rent. Um, but a housing bill obviously affects everybody. Um, but I, I would assume less so this neck of the woods. Well, that's right. The housing issues uh, of affordability really are around Boston. Uh, but, you know, in New Bedford, with South Coast Rail coming a couple of years from now, uh, and with the increased economic activity in the South Coast, uh, with what's going on uh, in uh, downtown New Bedford, there's more uh, realtors tell me every day there's more interest. Well, I was just going to ask you is it, while we're, th we're thinking housing now, and you kind of started to get on, is sort of the housing thing a preemptive thing for us? Uh, which, but you don't know. I guess it's the unknown, but it, it's not that far down the road. Well, it, that's right, Jim, and we've all been working uh, to see. Uh, economic activity grow here in New Bedford and the South Coast. Now it's starting, it's starting to, but what what will happen? Rents will rise and we, housing prices will uh, rise. Housing prices right. will rise and we all, all, myself and all my colleagues, we have a lot of constituents uh, living on that $800 a month social security check and as rents go uh, from 500 to Six hundred to eight hundred dollars a month. That puts a terrific squeeze on them. So part of this package ought to be thinking ahead to what happens when we go from uh, that five hundred dollar a month environment uh, to something that's more uh, compatible to what Boston people are paying in Boston. Right. Yeah. It's it yeah. It's more mm -hmm. preemptive. But I mean, you do have to think. And it's again, it's not that far down the road. It's funny, things always change, or they seem to change on a dime. You, th you think, oh, nothing has changed, and then all of a sudden, it's sort of like the economy. You never know when the recession has started until you're in it. And right. you look back, and you say, oh, yeah. That's where it turned. We are talking to State Representative Paul Schmidt here on the Beacon Hill Report. I'm Jim Marshall here on the New Bedford Cable Network. Uh, talk a little bit, the governor again releases his budget uh, the last, uh, the next to last week in July here. Obviously, revenue is an issue. I know that it's still uh, going to be up, but the up isn't as much as it has been the past couple years. Uh, I read something in the in the Globe, I guess, it, you know, does that signal that a recession, when I mean, you were just touching about it, does that mean a recession's around the corner? I don't think right. anybody knows that yet, but um, you're on the revenue committee. I am. You are the vice chair, you're on the ways and means committee, so this is right up your alley in a sense where as you look at the budget, the governor's budget, which is sort of a template, if you will, of the legislature's budget, but are you thinking, okay, we've got to look at, the monies aren't going to be as great as, as they've been, so we need to take, take precaution. Sure. So here's, here's what's happening so far as revenues go. Uh, <coughs> the last two years have been phenomenally good years uh, for Massachusetts. We ended up with huge... Uh, budget surpluses. And you put uh, the unexpected. money away too, the we, rainy day fund. We have the third largest rainy day fund of any state now. Right. Yep. We are a billion dollars over where we had, where we were back in 08 
before we went into the recession. So I give a lot of credit to people like uh, Senator Rodericks, Senate Ways and Means Chairs, uh, the Speaker, Senate President, uh, for socking away uh, a lot of the budget surplus that we had. Because guess what? We're going to need it. Right. We, we will go into a recession. And what, you know, the funny thing is people will say, well, that's, that's great. We, the, why isn't the money coming back? Or why aren't we spending the money? Because when we do hit the recession, you're not going to see the impact as much as you could. That's right. We all remember what happened uh, 10 years ago. So a couple of great years behind us looking in the rearview mirror. This current year that we're in, uh, they were forecasting something like a 3% increase in uh, revenues, which is okay. pretty darn good. Yeah. And for the first six months, we're actually tracking, I think I read, we're a hundred, couple of hundred thousand, a hundred million. I have to keep remembering <laughs> I'm in the state budget now, not in the uh, town budget. Uh, you just add three zeros to everything. We're a couple of hundred million over uh, the benchmark for that 3% increase. But now we're starting to deal uh, with 2021 budget. And uh, we definitely are being cautious. We won't have the same type of increase as we have had. And that article that you just read uh, in the Boston Globe was from an, a uh, taxpayers association that was really looking at things in the most conservative way uh, possible and assuming the worst possible outcomes everywhere. And they were saying, you know, if all the downsides right. occur next year, we could be back in a deficit situation. Right. And I think that that was good, a good word of caution to us. Well, it would, you, being a member of the Ways and Means and the Revenue, prob you probably have to look at things from worst case scenario. We do. Um, we, it's our responsibility. Right. Um, so, so the budget for 2021, which the governor will release, and by the way, that's the first word, not the last word. Correct. Uh, the uh, legislature then takes up uh, the issue of the budget and actually allocates the money. But uh, we'd like to see what the governor's uh, priorities are. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, the legislature and the governor are working pretty well together these days. And by the way, most people I speak to are very happy to see in Massachusetts people working together. Nobody wants what's happening down in Washington uh, where nothing happens. They're just at loggerheads with each other, the House, the Senate, the Republicans, the Democrats. No, here in Massachusetts, people work together pretty darn well. And so we're interested in what he has to say about the budget, and then that'll get, get turned over uh, to the House. What do you think that means when, when um, I, I've always said that, and it's funny because it doesn't really get the attention media-wise that no more do no one document has more of an impact on a person's life than their town or city budget, the state budget. It just does. People don't realize it. It's boring print. It's boring TV, but it does have the impact. How do you see uh, as the overview right now? Obviously, you have your priorities in the legislature for for the district. Um, do you think that there'll be a lot of um, a lot of your priorities will be funded, or is it going to be tough this year because the the revenue issues? Yeah, so you know, uh, it'll be harder uh, to get our priorities uh, funded this year because we, <coughs> excuse me, we have already committed for another significant increase in Chapter seventy, which is education money. And, all, and that goes to all the municipalities. Which goes to all the right. municipalities. By the way, uh, New Bedford uh, got an increase in, in this year's budget of nearly $15 million. And we are projected to get an in increase of yet another $15 million in the upcoming budget. So, and those are, I mean, we can't do anything more important than provide for education. It's what it's what breaks down inequality. It's the ticket that everybody needs. So it's wonderful that we've done that, but that commitment extends out for the next four or five years. And living up to that commitment is going to make all the other things that we want to do uh, 
a little bit more difficult. Yeah. And, and it's, it, the, the interesting thing too, and people might obviously we're in New Bedford, and uh, you know I know other people will see it in other towns, but the small. I mean, you represent Westport. I do. The need is is there for Westport too. They're they're building a new school, new school system, really. Yes, we are in uh, Westport, uh, but uh, you know the Westports of this world uh, don't. The percentages have the are less. Same. It, it, Correct. Yeah. So I can see it representing both a rural community and an urban community. I uh, I see the need. By the way, for me personally. Uh, my priority for the next couple of years really is going to be early education. I, I, Kindergarten, I, even before? Pre-K. Pre-K. Pre yeah. Every educator I speak to uh, tells me uh, that uh, the uh, discrepancy between some kids and other kids coming into kindergarten. Some kids have been in pre-K, they've become socialized, they've been, they've been, they've been spoken to, read to. Uh, they've been doing things together. Other kids have have maybe just been at home, and what have they been doing? Perhaps just watching the television all day long. And those differences at kindergarten are likely to remain going right up through the system. So, get, giving every kid a quality early education. I think is absolutely fundamental uh, to our future. We've secured much better funding uh, for New Bedford K through 12. And now the next fight to me is making sure that all of our kids are in pre-K. You talked uh, off camera too, then we all got a few minutes left, but I want to make sure that you touch upon some of the issues here, New Bedford wise, that you wanted to, uh, to update folks on. Sure. Um, so I'll let you have at that as well. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Well, just I'll just start off with something I uh, did yesterday. Uh, the lieutenant governor uh, was in town, and uh, she brought with her a three and a half million dollar uh, package uh, from the state uh, for the city of uh, New Bedford uh, to continue the improvements to Union Street. Uh, we've worked on Union Street going right up as far as the New Bedford Harbor Hotel yep. and this extra uh, package will allow us to go right up uh, to County Street uh, and you can see the revival in street activity. And it's all, it started at Route 18. It started Almost. down yeah. and, and yeah. worked its way up and, and, and this package will give us an opportunity to continue right on up. Uh, to uh, County Street and then listening to the mayor uh, describe some of his aspirations uh, we'll then be able to go north on County Street uh, and also south on County. So when I, when I was a kid uh, I lived around the Boston area but we summered in Dartmouth and uh, my mother loved being in Dartmouth. We wouldn't go back to Boston until the day before school. So we did our back to school shopping in downtown New Bedford. Mm -hmm. And I just remember the commercial activity that was going on there, the hustle and the bustle that was going on uh, back in the 50s and the 60s. And I see some of that starting to return. And, and those grants, those I was going to say those aren't easy to get either. I mean, you're vying against other It's very competitive. Communities. Totally competitive. Yep. So you've got a, the delegation, the mayor, really the whole team has to gotta come work, together and gotta say. Gotta work together. And it seems as though the success has been there because you have started. Um, you look at Union Street from the bottom up and it's, it's really done, yep. the monies have really gone very well. Sure. And in a similar vein, the last couple of years, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had a lot of money uh, put into dredging the port. And that also, uh, those are competitive grants. They require uh, the full support of the delegation, the mayor, uh, working together. Thankfully, we have a good relationship with the governor and lieutenant governor. And so that part of the economic activity in New Bedford, our port, which is really... And the mayor our, says the port is the economic engine of the city. Well, it is. Nobody else has a port like this. Uh, and he's been absolutely right that we need to protect it, protect it first, expand it, 
so that we can continue to grow and take business away from other ports, north and south. So those are the kinds of activities working together, the delegation, the mayor working with the governor. And it's funny, you look at New Bedford too, and I, and I brought this up as well, um, and I'm just using New Bedford sort of as the hub, if you will, but you, you've got the seaport down here. You've got, you've got air, you've got a, you know, you got a airport. You've got, you'll have commuter rail. I mean, there's a lot of things that this city has, this region has, that really nobody else has in the state. Um, and, and that must lend to your abilities to get monies. Well, it certainly gives us a very good uh, story to tell. Yeah, I was mentioning, so I mentioned that grant that we received for Union Street. Uh, just last weekend, I happened to go to a movie uh, at the Whaling Museum. Uh, and after the movie uh, let out, my wife and I walked up Union Street and we went into the uh, New Bedford Harbor Hotel uh, for a, a, a light supper and a drink. And the place was booming. And it was just so wonderful to see every parking space on Union Street taken up, to see a lively crowd mm -hmm. uh, around the bar and the tables at the hotel. And I just thought, yeah, this is good. This is good. We're, this is what young people are looking for, this kind uh, of authentic place that's not Disney World. We are what we are. Uh, there's nighttime activity going on, there's cultural activities going on, and I am sure that with a connection to Boston, we're gonna attract more young people, and they're going to be interested in the quality of our schools, they're gonna be committed uh, to our schools, and they're gonna be further help uh, to keep improving the quality of our education. You talked about uh, you know education pre-education as well. Um, Union Street, what are some of the other priorities that you are kind of focusing on in the next six months or so during this session, the rest of the session? Well, I, I have a, a, a bill that is, I think, impo particularly important to the surroundings of uh, New Bedford. Many of the towns along uh, Buzzards Bay and on the Cape do not have sewers. They work, people yeah. work with septic systems. Yep. And those septic systems, don't take nitrogen. Uh, they don't treat for nitrogen. So the nitrogen tends to leach out into our rivers and into our bay. And nitrogen encourages algae to grow, which kills eelgrass, kills our shellfish, kills our fishing stock. And uh, I, I have a bill which will allow uh, uh, the state revolving fund uh, which currently goes to large-scale uh, stormwater projects, mm -hmm. would allow it to be uh, loaned out to municipalities so that they can, in turn, make low-cost loans to homeowners who live along the ocean or along the river uh, to uh, upgrade their septic systems to treat for nitrogen. Costs about $20,000. Yeah, it's expensive. Yep. It's expensive, but we have to do it. Because it impacts Buzzards Bay. It, it yeah. impacts Buzzards Bay, which is a very important part well, I mean, like of you our just, infrastructure. Yeah, I just said it's it's really the the hub of the hub of the area, no question about it. Lots coming up. I appreciate you coming in uh, as always. I will see you in six months, <laughs> the way it works out. So by that time, um, the session will be just about over. Well, we'll have a lot to talk exactly. about uh, by that time, Jim. And thank you very much. For for having me, this is a wonderful show, and uh, I know folks really appreciate uh, the information that they learn from it. Well, I appreciate that. That's going to do it for this edition of the Beacon Hill Report. I'm Jim Marshall of the New Bedford Cable Network. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.